Hello, I'm Dr. Tess Laurie, and welcome to Tess Talks. Today, I'm speaking to Rabita Chatwin. Rabita is a full-time meditator, a UK tutor, a uni tutor of critical thinking, and a hypnotherapist. I'm very pleased to know Rabita through the Mind Health Committee at the World Council for Health. But I first came across Rabita on the from the Telegram channel called COVID Positive News. And I thought, how wonderful. Here is something positive in the face of all the negative uh, news and, and uh, messaging that we receive daily on our, on our social media feeds. So part of today, I, I'm hoping to learn from Rabita how he uh, came to be so positive uh, and uh, amidst all the, the um, fear-mongering around us um, and, uh, and what he's learned that others can benefit from uh, in reducing their anxiety and stepping away from fear. So welcome, Rabita. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Could you tell me first... What is a full-time meditator? Yeah, so the reason that I say uh, a full-time meditator and not a meditator is normally because when somebody thinks about meditation, they normally think about maybe doing 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. Um, sometimes people might even recommend doing an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. I actually came to the... I came to the realization on my own, but then it was actually confirmed. I went to a Thai forest monastery in Thailand because before this whole COVID situation, I spent a lot of time traveling. And um, it was actually also in the Buddhist teachings also that um, the, the Buddha said, you know, you need to be focusing on the present moment all the time. So, but so that was kind of a confirmation for me, really, that meditation is not just something you do 20 minutes in the morning or in the evening. If you, if you, if you practice it seriously, it's something that you aim to do constantly all the time. And this was something that I'd already started to do through intense practice. Um, but, but that's why I say a full-time meditator. Yeah. Mm, so if I can, if I get it correctly, it's, it's a it's an awareness of the present. Or yeah. So, well, what I like a lot about meditation is that there's actually a lot of science now that can explain what um, the Buddhists and Hindus and others have said for thousands of years. So, in in Buddhism, they talk about the the end of your suffering or ending your suffering. If you can if you can stay present it ends your suffering. Um, what, what they found now with, um, with science is there's actually a part of the brain that, that lights up in brain scans called the default mode network. And the default mode network um, is activated. It lights up when we are going into the past and when we're thinking about the future. And the reason that that causes suffering is because, um, well, first of all, they, they say that approximately 50% of the time we're usually going into the past or we're going into the future. But the, the reason that that's a problem is because of negativity bias, because we generally go into the past feeling regret or wishing that things had been different. And we usually go into the future um, imagining that that would be better than where I am now or wishing for something that we don't have. And so, and they say also that um, um, what's quite interesting is that when we go into the past and we're remembering our memories, they're usually actually not very accurate. In fact, they're no better than chance about 50% of the time. So not only do we go into the past and worry about regret things that we've done the memories that we have are not that accurate anyway so that's so what so what the science has found is that when we practice focusing on 
the present. So in the beginning, we normally start with focusing on the breath. The reason for that is just because it's something that we do consciously and unconsciously. But you can focus on a candle, you can focus on uh, music, sound. But when you bring your attention to the present moment, it actually shuts down or deactivates the default mode network. And so what they found now in science is that because that because we, it reduces the, the thinking, that it reduces anxiety, it reduces depression, um, it reduces, um, I don't know, kind of worry, mm -hmm. and we, we can then find peace. But I mean, this, I know, uh, this is what is really fascinating because you'll find, you know, I mean, and I was one of those people who would say, well, you know, um, I'm a warrior, a warrior, as in, you know, I worry a lot and, I'm, and, I, and I have to because I, I've got to keep my mind going and, and busy because I've got so many things to think about and, uh, and all of that. So um, it's, all, it's often um, people who suffer from uh, anxiety or worries um, find it particularly difficult to quiet the mind and, um, and be in the now, as you're describing. Um, so I was... Um, Surprised, not surprised, but uh, you know, you told me that you'd uh, for many years suffered from depression and suicidal ideation, and so you know, it's remarkable to see you now speaking with you uh, um, and here and seeing just how well balanced you are and, and and how meditation has helped you. So I wondered if you could share with us a little bit about your experience and how meditation helped you to overcome your anxiety and depression. Sure. And before I go on to that, I might, um, maybe we can, we might talk about this more, but what you just said about um, people worrying all the time and that we need to worry in order to get things done and things like this. Um, the other thing that happens when we focus on the present and we let those thoughts kind of re re reside, kind of go down and um, diminish is that we become much more connected to the intuition. So we become more connected to that gut feeling, that gut instinct, that or, or, or the, the feeling of my heart says that I should do this. And so when we can stay in that space, we have a feeling of knowing. Um, and so we can still... Uh, actually, in Hinduism, they say that um, the thinking is actually one of the senses. So, you know, we've got smell, we've got touch, and thought should also be used in order for us to be able to do, do practical things. So, um, so, that, so that's, yeah, I just wanted to say that kind of when we go down into that, into that, that, that space, that silence, we, we have a, a kind of a deeper knowing of, of, what we would really like to do. And that can help us also in our decision-making. But the, with regards to the suicidal ideation, yeah, I wanted to talk about that a little bit just because, well, obviously it's on the increase. There's an increase of depression and anxiety and things like that. But I often say to people, if you feel anxious or worried or depressed, you're actually normal. You know, this is, we feel so much like there's something wrong with us. And I know I did. I felt like I was the only one. But yeah, I did. I suffered very, very badly. It was it was very intense suicidal ideation. And I say suicidal ideation because I didn't actually want to kill myself. I was just constantly thinking about how it would be better if I wasn't here. And the reason for that was for me, where I grew up and, and what I saw it, it just didn't make sense to me. And I felt, and this also could be, you know, quite related to what could possibly happen now if, if the truth about the, this whole COVID pandemic and, and, and the vaccine side effects and all of this, if this all starts to come out, people could be then entering into this, this feeling of none of this makes sense to me. This cognitive dissonance of my worldview doesn't fit with with um with what's really going on but i, I grew up in um a, a, a town in nottingham and there was uh, 
it was very common for um, girls at school to 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 fall pregnant at kind of 12 years old, uh, 14 years old. There was a lot of car theft. Um, there was a lot of drugs. A lot of people leaving school um, with no aspirations and no desire, really, not absolutely no idea idea whatsoever what they wanted to do. And everything around me just didn't make sense. And I just felt like this cannot be it. This cannot be everything. And ironically enough, it was probably my optimism that kept me going because I was determined to go and discover other places in the world and find out if all of the world is like this because it just, um, yeah, it, it didn't make sense to me at I'm all. I'm sure what you're saying resonates so much with so many young people today and not just young people, but I would think especially young people. Um, and uh, and certainly it resonates with me as well from, uh, you know, from, from my past. Uh, I've previously spoken about uh, how, you know, some years ago it just felt like things don't work. So what is this all about? Um, the system doesn't work and, and what's the point of it all? So um, please continue uh, and tell us how we, how we can break out of that cycle. Um, so my, my uh, when you, because when you say like the system doesn't work, um, my, some people talk about the awakening or waking up and things like this, that actually came much later. For me, that came with the war, uh, the war on terror and the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction. And I, that it was at that point that I started to kind of go down the rabbit hole of what have we not been told? Um, so that kind of came later. So, but maybe also that was one of, the, well, I guess that was also kind of one of the reasons why I was feeling so depressed and just felt, I used to use poetry as, as a form of escape or a form of release. So I would, I would write lots of poems about um, death and death is the ultimate adventure and all of this. Um, and then at some point I was working and I felt unhappy and I felt lost. And, it, and I was just saying to you before this interview, it was probably kind of late 20s, early 30s that I... I decided I I am so it was, it was a real determination within me that I am going to find out what happiness is. I want to be happy, and I went to a books book, bookstore and I got um, some books from I guess it was the self development section. Um, I didn't know at that time really anything much about spirituality and what spirituality refers to, but the books that I got were to do with ending your suffering so ending your suffering or being happy obviously kind of um took me into that that spiritual uh, realm of um, meditation and uh, kind of other areas there and I, I read all these different books and what i did was i i i i'm not saying that this is for everyone and i can only talk about my own experience but i really hope that what I share now might help some people, but I, I decided that the main teachings of, of these books at that time were to stay in the present moment. So meditate, practice being in the present moment, because that was the ending of the suffering. Following my intuition, which is also what I was referring to before, you get a deeper connection to your intuition. And getting out of my comfort zone or, or, or facing my fears because so much of what stops us from changing our lives is that fear of trying something new, getting out into a different location or a different job or changing a relationship. Um, so I took that extremely seriously and I, I quit my job and I took my money and I went to Colombia and I spent nine months traveling around I, yeah. I could just leap in there and just say you know one of the things that i think is particularly hard for all of us as individuals is the expectations that others and the world seem to place on us from a very young age so we don't really get to know ourselves we just know that we ought to do that and we ought to do this and we need to that requirement and that you know and that job and we need those things so um you know it's very brave 
And what's required actually probably for all of us uh, is, is to get to that point where we trust and accept ourselves. And then we can do these things like just give up the job, give up that, give up all the things that are not clearly good for us and go off and, um, or, and find ourselves. We don't have to go anywhere. But <laughs> yeah. I, um, in, in hindsight now, I can see that I had absolutely no idea who I was. I felt completely lost. Um, and again, that's linked to that, that feeling of none of it makes sense. Um, but at the time it was desperation. It was, I do not want to suffer like this anymore. I have to take action. And you said it's very brave. It's interesting because I was talking to my auntie actually, uh, maybe one or two months ago now. And she said like, how did you do? Cause I left, I left Nottingham. I went traveling. I've, I've done a lot of different things. And I explained to her, I, I explained to her kind of what I'm explaining now. I said, you know, I was unhappy and I, and I decided I wanted to do something else. And she said, yes, I understand that. She said, but how did you do it? What made you do it? And I don't have the answer to that question. And as I've traveled and met people around the world that, well, here, here where I am now in Portugal, there's a lot of people from uh, Brazil, a lot of Brazilians. And many of my friends here were in favelas in the ghettos of Brazil. And the stories they have are horrific of their childhoods. If anyone's ever seen the, the, the film City of God, um, not all favelas are like that, but it's extreme compared to, um, you know, perhaps your, well, compared to Europe and mm -hmm. the, the US and Canada and things like this. Um, and there are some people that decide, I don't want that anymore. I want to get out of this situation and try and experience something else. Why some people do that and some people don't, it's a mystery. I really don't know. But I, I felt a calling to, to just, I can only describe it like it was just, I w it was a determination. I really decided it was a decision. I'm going to find out that this cannot this cannot be it i don't want to live like this forever hmm. so how did um what what are the sort of practical steps that helped you helped that removed um uh your suicidal ideations through meditation so well this was really kind of the this kind of nine months that when i left everything and went traveling and so I, I had a guidebook and I just followed my intuition. Where do I feel that I want to go now? And, and really kind of, where do I feel? Where do I feel drawn to? And what do I feel drawn to do? Um, and I also, as I said, faced fears. Um, I was quite extreme. I was afraid of heights. So I decided to do a five day paragliding course, which involved five flights on my own. The first time that I did that, I was so afraid that I couldn't even hear the, the radio because you have a radio on you. And it, it literally was my unconscious or subconscious that, that got me down because I wasn't present anymore, wow. but it worked. I, I, I'm not afraid of heights anymore. And, um, I was afraid of sharks because I watched Jaws when I was a child. So I decided to go diving. Uh, anyway, but the, but yes, with the, with the meditation, it, it was, it was, uh, again, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit before it's neuroplasticity. If you keep doing it, if you just keep bringing your attention back to, uh, the, the, the present, and that can be the sounds in the room or the stillness or your breath, your, your brain will start to cooperate. And when it starts to cooperate, you can reach a point where it's the normal state. The normal state is that you are not going off into these worries. However, I totally appreciate, I was talking to a musician uh, one or two days ago who was saying that he started learning to play music when he was a, a, a you know a young, young boy that, we only have so much time in our lives to do to 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 take to to go to that kind of level of um practice but i spent 
at one point I spent three months in a hammock watching the sea literally every day for three months apart from going to eat I would just bring my attention back to the ocean and at some point I just started to feel like I'm in a a constant almost constant it's not always constant but 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 that but uh, uh, most of the time I feel like I'm in a very peaceful calm um, joyful place mm. um I think for, um I personally I find uh happiness uh equivalent to purpose and uh if I have purpose and meaning in my life um then uh then I feel absolutely very very well uh and I think a lot of uh people might struggle well I wonder about happiness because it comes with it has connotations of uh of uh sort of you know celebration and uh and a lot of people attach material things to the uh, concept of happiness, like if I have this and if I have that, it's going to make me happy. Whereas uh, I think um, the reason why uh, purpose works is you don't actually need uh, any any money or material things for purpose. It's a, it's a state, isn't it? It's a state of uh, feeling useful uh, and in service. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, the idea with meditation then is you, you have your ego. So your ego is well okay that's slightly maybe that's slightly different um kind of point um when we go to the external for happiness um whether you know it's a drink or it's um whatever it is that you're going uh, outside of yourself to 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 get the sugar you get going outside of yourself to get that happiness it's short-lived it gives you a boost you feel that happiness for a moment and then it's gone and then, yeah, then you go back to that place of feeling what you felt before. So if you're feeling that there's a lack of meaning in your life, you will go back to that again. Purpose, um, and I've actually got a friend who's um, um, quite, he's quite, quite famous in California for the, there's a big purpose movement there, helping people to find their purpose. And purpose is actually very much linked to this idea of being present because it's, it's, it's about knowing what, what, what you feel called to do inside yourself rather than um, living in the distraction. And this is maybe where it would link to the ego because the ego, what the, what, what the Buddhists and others are talking about with ego is it's the conditioning, it's the programming, it's the socialization. It's not who we truly are. So an another way you could say it is that when you're born, you don't yet know your name, you don't know your country, you don't have any information about yourself yet, but you still exist. So it's about finding out what that is that you are before you have all of this extra information from outside telling you what you should do. Yeah, all the labels. That's a really great way of, of thinking about it. Um, yeah. And when you find purpose, as I feel I've also done now, um, yeah, it can't be described really, can it? You wake up in the morning and you feel so motivated to live your day. Yes, and gratitude as well. You know, I find, you know, even uh, in those times, because we all – will feel the pressure of uh, of the day the requirements and the you know and and also of the you know the gloominess being um being uh, imposed on us um if one can find that place of gratitude um for the the bird that's singing so beautifully outside or or the touch of your partner or you know the, if, or or just uh, another day to uh to enjoy the challenges um that uh, that we all face um i find that that uh, is is um is a very good way of stepping away from fear and uh, and uh, and also just allowing one just to feel grateful for for being here and um and being um present at this at this time so uh 
the gratitude, um, maybe I'll just quickly mention, yes. um, the Heart Math Institute um, has done a lot of research on um, the heart and how that works. But there's a meditation that they do um, where you focus on the heart and you focus on gratitude. So only, so it's, again, it's a meditation. You're focusing on one object. So you're focusing on the heart space and, and then just thinking about someone or something which really makes you feel grateful and then, and then focusing on that emotion. And then what they found is that the heart then goes into what they call coherence. So the heartbeat then starts to beat at this coherent rhythm. And when you go into that coherent rhythm at the same time, you also feel that peace, you feel that calmness and you feel more connected to your intuition. So mm, that's yeah. fascinating. I, I'd like to touch a, a little bit on hypnotherapy because that's um, your practice and uh, something that I know absolutely nothing about. I'm sure many of the people watching will feel the same. And it's part of the reason I, I'm, I'm invi I invited you to speak is really because, um, you know, we're at a point where we really need to explore other sorts of, uh, of ways of getting well and feeling well. And, uh, and hypnotherapy seems to be one of those um, new modalities. Yeah, so hypnotherapy is, well, is so fascinating and there's so much you could say about it. But actually, it's been around for a really, really long time. And they used to use um, hypnotherapy in the 1800s. And it was a standard modality for um for, for many different things but also for surgery as well and there was a lady whose name i can quickly found find who was doing who did the talk with you about homeopathy janie laval yes yeah who was talking about um how uh, homeopathy is actually a, something that you can choose to take in france as part of your medical training and actually in france as well there's it's um you can actually have surgery under hypnosis as well. But hypnosis or hypnotherapy, the it's not completely, it's either not completely understood because I actually feel that there is quite a, a, a simple explanation for it actually, or it's, uh, uh, it's still, it's, it's going again, which you've talked about with, um, uh, with Janie Lavelle and also with Kim Knight about this idea of energy and this, the, the quantum physics, which is still a relatively new area or not new area, but we're still trying to understand everything. But basically hypnosis is, so if we talk about the brainwave states, we've got um, beta is the brainwave state that we're normally in when we're thinking. Um, and then alpha is when we start to focus on something. So we, 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 we increase the alpha brainwave states when we're meditating. Um, but it's also when we are uh, um, focused on the Super Bowl. I like to give the Super Bowl as an example because the, the Super Bowl, everybody is focused on the Super Bowl and that's why they'll pay millions or however much for an advert because it when you are in that state, you're more connected to your subconscious, you're more suggestible. So the, that state of focus, the alpha brainwave state, it's also when you're, when you're in the zone doing sports and everything just flows, or if you, um, you don't notice what you're doing when you're driving for 10 minutes and you've, you've, your subconscious has taken over. And then there's theta, and theta is the hypnagogic state. It's also called hypnagogia. And the, hip, the hypnagogic state is the state that we're in when we just wake up. It's also, um, it's a trance-like state. It's a state where we become so connected to our subconscious that we can start to visualize, we can start to see things, we can hallucinate or dream. And then after that, we're asleep as delta. So hypnosis is about focus on the hypnotist voice or the hypnothera hypnotherapist voice and then letting go which is the most difficult part letting go 
or trusting um, or surrendering into that state to allow ourselves to go as much as we can into the theta brainwave state. And when we go into that theta brainwave state, we become extremely connected to the subconscious. And that's when the, the miracles, if you like, of, of uh, hypno, hypnotherapy come in. Because what you then do when you've relaxed someone down into this state, this dreamlike state, is you can uh, ask them to, you can guide it, but also to some extent, you can say, you do whatever you need to do um, in order to release any internal stored stress. And so hypnotherapy works with psychosomatic conditions. Anything which is stress-related, stored internal stress, and this is where the energy comes in because you can talk about blocked energy, but any stored stress within the body from trauma, from any negative memories, emotions, thoughts, feelings, sensations. And we ask the person, or at least this is how I do hypnotherapy and how I train to do it, because the, the, there are other ways, the traditional ways that you have a script and you just read a script and take people on a journey to release um to to relieve anxiety for example but the way that i've learned to do it and trained to do it is it's content free so you work with the with the client you work with the with the person in front of you to release whatever it is that comes up for them and when you do that release it can have it can totally heal if you like anything that's psychosomatic. So that can be emotional and it can also be physical. So if it's, um, I've had people that after a session, they didn't have uh, tinnitus, tinnitus anymore, which you can't go to the doctor and get a medication to fix. And the reason is, well, actually the person's doctor told him that he, it was stress and tension in the jaw that was creating that pressure. So we released the stress and that disappeared. Um, arthritis has gone um, and also depression and worry and anxiety also can go people generally talk about and they don't always need to explain to me or talk to me about what they've released either they don't even need to tell me what the problem is they can say that I've let go of something that afterwards they might say I've, I've just let go of something that I've been carrying with me for years I saw it I understood it I let it go and and then they I usually say, okay, take, give, give it three days and then come back to me and let me know what the changes are because the changes can be physical pain, can be any tension in the body, but it can also be emotional as well. People feel like that backpack of stress has been lifted off. So, Rabita, if someone came to you with uh, depression and anxiety and um, were uh, already on medication, um, what would, would that affect your ability to help them? So the main things that we shouldn't, that, that it's better not to get involved with is any kind of psychosis, schizophrenia, any um, condition where people are taking uh, heavy medication to change the chemical balance of the you know, of, of the brain and what's happening. Because when you do go into this state and you make changes, you're not sure how that's going to affect or influence or, or be influenced by the medication that these people are taking. Um, and also if it's just a kind of an unstable state where somebody so you can work, there are hypnotherapists that will work with people, for example, with schizophrenia, um, bipolar, um, bipolar, manic depression. Um, the, these are the kind of the, the, the conditions where you need to be more careful. Mm. So how could, how um, if someone was suffering from, you know, uh, anxiety and depression in response to the, the COVID situation, for example, how, and they were to seek out a hypnotherapist, 
what sort of response and duration of treatment would they expect? Could they expect, I say? Yeah. So, well, the, the first thing is that when you do a hypnotherapy session, the hypnotherapist can't know until after the session what the results are. So it's possible that after one session, um, what if, if it's depression, for example, or anxiety, then you'd ask the person to go back to the moment where that depression or anxiety started. So that, that traumatic moment in the past where it was first initiated or if you are dealing with an addiction, you might go back to where was that first, first moment in the past where you used that addiction in, in order to deal with the stress and, the, and, and, and the, the trauma of whatever was going on, often in your childhood. And so people can go, can when you're in this state, and um, this is why it's, it's kind of linked a little bit to um, the ayahuasca and the DMT, which is now used um, in, um, as, a, as a therapy. And there are studies being carried out on those but it's a much lesser version of that. If you were to take DMT or ayahuasca, you would be, um, it would be much more intense, but you still go into that theta brainwave state. So you're still going down into that kind of dream awake state where you're connected to the subconscious. And so what happens is people, um, they go on a journey, they see what it is for themselves within themselves, and then they, release it so what i usually do is i say okay now imagine that so the negative image feeling thought emotion feel it coming up through the body feel it coming up through the chest the neck and the head and then just like steam like smoke or imagine that there's an energy or a source kind of sucking it out just release it from the body and let it go you don't need it anymore it's not helping you or serving you anymore and for some people that can be enough for, for other people, they can feel worse afterwards, which is perhaps counterintuitive, but that's actually a good thing because that means that things are now coming up. Things are rising to the surface that have been really stored deep down. And so I think it's, I guess you could, you could liken it to psychotherapy or some kind of um, talk therapy where you are going into the, the the root cause of an issue but unlike talk therapy it's about identifying it understanding it acknowledging it don't go into the drama but just see it and then let it go you don't need it anymore so, so it's about a release. So the way of processing past trauma would you say processing and releasing yeah, it's it's so part of it is is processing and releasing and um, making peace with or letting go of uh, past trauma, and the other part of it is also guidance as well. So you can say, for example, okay, I want you to imagine that there's a door, and on the other side of this door, you're going to see the one memory from your life that is the most important memory for you moving forward in your life. And then what they'll do is the person will go into that room, they'll see something and it will make sense to them. And then afterwards they'll come back and they'll say, okay, I know what I need to do now. So it's, um, it can be guidance and it can also be um, releasing the, 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 the trauma or the stress, which is causing emotional or physical psychosomatic conditions. Yeah. So is there anything, um, physical in the therapy um like tapping or or even um uh, affirmations that um you you use yeah so the main techniques the the reason that the, the the way that i do it and how it's linked to the meditation is that if you go down into a deep state of meditation you also start activating those or going into those theta brainwave states and that's when people describe, you know, visions and um, uh, uh, it's the, the, the act, they're going into the subconscious. 
Um, but if you do it in, in meditation, you can't, you can't go on a journey because you would think, and then you just pull yourself back out. So the, the hypnotherapist is, is just the guide or the facilitator and you focus on their voice and you, you follow that. The, there are some, a few different things you can do. So one of them very much is the placebo effect or the power of belief, because if you don't believe that it's going to work, it won't work. And if you don't believe it's going to work, you won't go into hypnosis. So you have to be open to the possibility of it happening in the first place for it to even work. And so placebo and then also suggestion. So you can, but at the same time, and this is something some, a lot of people are very afraid of hypnosis because they think that it's mind control or I'm, you know, I won't know what's happening to me. You can actually hear everything that the hypnotherapist is saying, and you can't do anything that would go against your own personal will. So you, um, so if, if, if I were to say, okay, um, imagine that feeling of um, gratitude getting stronger and stronger and stronger and just feel it filling up your body. You, you, you have to want to do that, but you can, you can use suggestion. Um, there's also the, the mystery of the placebo and language also. So the words that you use are important. If you say, for example, try to open your eyes and notice that you can't, well, try signals that you will fail. So there's certain words that you also use to, to, to help the person to go deeper. But ultimately, once they're in that state, you, they're doing the work. It's not really you. You're just the facilitator and the guide. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. Rabita, what would you say to uh, to someone who hasn't uh, heard much about hypnotherapy before or meditation um, but would like to learn more? Is there some way or some resources you can recommend? Um, well, yes. Um, if you just want to learn about um, hypnosis, hypnotherapy, I trained at the UK Hypnosis Academy and the UK Hypnosis Academy has a YouTube channel. It was founded by Carl Smith. And Carl Smith, he's a little bit unorthodox because, as I said, it's very content free and there's no script, which is very traditional and the, and the traditional way. Um, but he has loads of videos explaining how it works, what he does, why he does it. So that would be for the hypnotherapy. If you uh, wanted to know more about meditation, um, it's been a little bit, it's actually been a while since I've um, uh, sought out uh, kind of meditation to practice. But there is the um, Vipassana meditation. It's very intensive though, but there's Vipassana meditation. I think it's dharma.org and you can do free 10 day retreats and it's an intensive very worthwhile introduction to meditation for anyone that would like to do it would like to really kind of try it in a serious fashion because it's 10 days you're doing it all day every day for 10 days and you really go through a journey as you are kind of sitting there for eight hours a day trying to focus on your breath. So it's very intensive. But the first time I've done four of the 10 day uh, Vipassana retreats. And the first one that I did afterwards, I came out feeling just this kind of floating calm and bliss. And then you start thinking again and, and, and going back into the, the, the worries and the thoughts. And then you kind of are brought out of that state. Um, otherwise, there's lots of apps. Um, I've forgotten the name of the, is it Mindspace or something? But there's an, there's, there's an app that you can use if you just would like to try it for 20 minutes in the morning. But it, it's like anything. It's, it's only going to work if you, if you really practice it. And meditation is also, some people describe it as kind of mind strengthening. It's um, if you go to the gym, 
and you go every day and you really take it seriously, you're going to build physical muscles. Well, it's the same thing with meditation. If you do it every day, you're going to build those muscles that are going to allow you to, to stay present. And it's not, it's not the only way for somebody to um, kind of come out of a depression or anxiety, but it was, it, it's, it worked for me. And because it worked for me, um, I advocate it, but yeah, it's not, I'm not claiming it's the only solution by, by any means. Yeah. Uh, well, another uh, modality for the toolkit uh, and, uh, you know, I just want to thank you so much, Rebita, for coming on and telling us all about that. And to the people watching, if you want to, if you want some of Rebita's positivity to rub off on you, I urge you to sign up to the COVID positive news channel on um, on telegram and uh, get your daily dose of positivity from rubito thanks um, sure if i could also just perhaps quickly say this uh, just uh, um, two things one of them is that actually now um because it's relevant with covid um long covid and um an anos anosmia anosmia yes a lot and of smell paro parosmia so uh, parosmia, I, as I understand it, is you have kind of a sulfuric flavor in the taste when you're eating, and it also affects the smell. And then an, an, an osmia is, is generally more of a total la loss of taste and smell. Well, th those are two things that already um, we know that we can treat with hypnosis as well. So the, the um, other kind of uh, long COVID symptoms I can't testify to or say, but, but certainly loss of taste and loss of smell are two things that um, have been very successfully treated with hypnotherapy. Well, that's really fascinating because uh, it's one of those things so many people complain of. Uh, it'll be great to get some feedback from, uh, from people watching. If they've had hypnotherapy for anosmia, let us know if, uh, if it's helped them. Um, Really, really and, interesting. Thank you. And if I may, so just to, a little uh, kind of promotion to finish is that as well as COVID positive news on Telegram, I also have my hypnotherapy website, um, which is robitochatwin.com. Um, but also there's the short uh, link. If you just type robito.info, it'll redirect you to the robitochatwin.com. And I actually offer my sessions on a sliding scale because I really want it to be available to anyone. So I start off with the price that it's actually worth. And then I ask people to pay what they can. So if anybody is interested and would like to try it, then um, there's not really that much to lose from giving it a go. The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rabita. Thank you, Tess. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.